All right, so we're continuing to have this conversation about hungering for Jesus. What, what does that mean? We want you to leave hungry today for Jesus. Um, this is second service. You guys leave hungry every week. You're like, <laughs> if he would just shorten it a little bit, you know, I could get there before I'm starving. But we want you to be hungry for Jesus. Um, we're convinced that God has created us with appetites, with hungers that only Jesus can satisfy. The three that we're going to talk about specifically today are our hungers for acceptance, belonging, and intimacy. Acceptance, belonging, and intimacy. Acceptance is this um, experience that we have when we're connected with someone who we're convinced is not judging or evaluating us uh, to give us their attention. They're not, they're not running us through these filters to decide if we deserve their attention or not. We're, we're accepted um, in, in their presence. Uh, we're built with a hunger for that. Belonging is this environment where we feel safe to be vulnerable and invited to contribute. We feel safe to be vulnerable and invited to contribute. This is what we want for our our children, right? To feel that they belong in our family, that our home is a place where they are safe to be vulnerable and not only invited. Our children are not only invited to contribute, they are expected to contribute, right? But that's that sense of belonging. Uh, And then intimacy, we often talk about intimacy. We connect that with sexual intimacy and we uh, think about that in those terms, but it's, it's a much broader Uh, category than that. Intimacy is this sense of being fully known and fully loved. That there is someone who knows everything about me and loves me. Um, We often fear that the more people get to know us, the less they will respect or like or admire us. But intimacy, what we're looking for, what we're created for, is to have a relationship with someone who knows us completely and loves us completely. So those those are hungers that we're born with, and uh, often uh, we, we recognize that. You don't even have to be a Jesus follower to f- recognize your hunger for acceptance, belonging, and intimacy. Everyone acknowledges that. But how do we go about satisfying those hungers? That, that's the big question. Um, often, I think in our, our culture, we've been taught to think that if we just find the right person, then these hungers will be satisfied. If I can find the right person to spend the rest of my life with, then my my needs for acceptance and belonging and intimacy will be satisfied every day forever. I've been married uh, 23 years, right? I got married in 2000 so that all I have to know is what year it is and I know how long I've been married. I'm a genius, I can teach you. 23 years and I can tell you, my wife is a wonderful human being. But if... I expect her to satisfy my hunger for acceptance, belonging, and intimacy every day without fail. I'm putting something on her she's not built to carry. She, she, she does her best, but she can't do it. As she looks to me for that, and I do my best, but I can't, I can't do it. So the idea that we just have to find the right person and these needs will always be satisfied is a myth. It's a lie that our culture tells us. There's, there's only one way to have these Appetite's really satisfied. So we need to talk about appetite a little bit. Why, why do we hunger for the things that we hunger for, and why do we pursue them in the ways that we pursue them? We have these, these uh, physical hungers, right? When you get hungry, there are, there are certain things that you want to eat, right? We don't all have the same appetites, and they're, they're shaped by our environment, by our culture, and how we're raised, Um, And it shows up on your grocery list. Your grocery list tells you how your environment has shaped you to eat. And so what's on your grocery list? My guess is it's pretty much the same things week after week show up on your grocery list. And that list will tell you the kinds of things that you have habitually developed to, to be hungry for, okay? So... Sometimes we try to trick ourselves and we, we're like, this week, we're eating healthy. You know, we're just putting healthy things on the grocery list. And then what do you end up doing? You, you get the healthy things, but you also are like, well, I can't only eat green beans. I have to also have something that I like. And so then you, you get ice cream and the green beans go bad before you eat them, but ice cream freezes, right? So it's always there. So th- this is an expression of, it's a revelation of how we were raised. My guess is, For most of us here in central Indiana, 
that when you get hungry, the first thing you want is not like some really uh, nicely boiled squid. Like do any of you, is that like what you, you're, you're starving and you're like, oh, I could really go from some squid right now. No, that's, that's not how you were raised. But there are places in the world, if you grew up in Japan, maybe, like that might be something that you're hungry for. So our hungers, our appetites are, are kind of developed by our environment and they reveal some things about us. And the, the question is, how do, we, how do we learn to hunger for the right kinds of food? It's easy to hunger for the wrong kinds of food because they're delicious, right? But it's difficult to hunger for the right kinds of food. Can you teach yourself to be hungry for vegetables instead of hamburgers? Yes, you can. Listen, there, <laughs> we have doubters. <laughs> I hear you. All right, you can. Listen, so there... Like this is some this is a big deal in the in the US, by the way. Lots of dollars and 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 research time has been spent on understanding nutrition and what makes people um, eat the way they eat so that so that we can eat and be healthy. Because uh, there are a lot of people in our country, in our culture, who are not satisfied with their physical health, you know? And so they want to get healthier. A lot of money has been spent, and all of this money and decades of research has come up with the same two basic answers, and they haven't really changed. Eat right and exercise. It's that simple. If it's really that simple, why is it so hard? Because we, we like the things we like. We're, we're used to eating things that are not good for us, and those habits are really hard to break. It's hard to train yourself to say, I'm hungry. What I could really go for is a good salad. It's hard to train yourself to do that, but you can do that. So a couple of the programs that are out there now that I think have figured out something special about this nutrition craze that we have in our country. Um, uh, two of them are, are Weight Watchers and Noom. I don't know much about anything else, but I know a little bit about Weight Watchers and a little bit about Noom because uh, these have been in our home at different times. So the difference I think that they figured out, and maybe there are other programs out there that do this, I just don't know, but they have added sort of this community um, element to their program. So you're not in this alone, but you're in this with other people who have the same dietary goals that you have. And this community creates this accountability, support, encouragement, because it's not that you need new information. You don't need new information. You know the things that you're eating are bad for you. <laughs> you don't need a scientist to tell you that. What you need is people on the journey with you who are going to support you and encourage you as you try to change your habits and change what you really hunger for. That sounds like discipleship to me. These are like discipleship communities around health. That's what they are. And it's like this covenant community where you have made this agreement and you have sealed your agreement with a payment. Like you paid to be a part of this group. You don't need to pay somebody to tell you that you should eat healthy and exercise, do you? Please don't pay somebody to tell you that. Like we already know that. What you're paying for is to be a part of this covenant community where, where there are gonna be people who help you out on the journey. It, it costs you something to be a part of that community. Friends, this is not a stretch to move this in a spiritual direction and say, like, if we're supposed to be changing how we pursue our appetites for acceptance, belonging, and intimacy, so that we learn to want the things that actually make us spiritually healthy, we don't need more information about what it takes to have a good relationship with God. You know the things. If you've been to church one time, someone probably said, you should read your Bible. You should probably pray. You should probably go to church and worship with other people. Like someone has told you those things. That's not new information. It hasn't changed in thousands of years. You don't need somebody to tell you that. What you need is to be a part of a covenant community that is moving in the direction of Jesus-centered living together. That's what you need. That's how your appetites get shaped and changed so that you begin to want the things that actually fill you up. All right, so uh, that's the preamble. That was supposed to take 60 seconds. How did I do? <laughs> we, we might be here past 1130. 
If you're okay with that, I'm gonna keep going. If you're not, a lot of people may have to go to the restroom around 11.31. Just take your purse, it's fine. All right, Uh, John chapter six, if you have a Bible, I invite you to open up there. We're gonna be in John six and um, read about Jesus as the bread of life. John six opens with this uh, famous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. All these people have gathered to hear Jesus teach. They've been there all day. They haven't had anything to eat. They're hungry. Jesus looks to his disciples and says, hey, why don't you feed this crowd? And they're like, (laughs) with what? And then he invites them to participate with him in this incredible miracle where they they give give over 5,000 people more than they can eat out of five loaves of bread and two fish. It's, it's incredible. We, we really need to put ourselves uh, in this culture for a minute because this is not just like a free meal. It's not like you, you, you went through the drive through at McDonald's and the person behind you paid for your, your um, food, right? That, that's not what this is. These are people who, how a food tastes is not nearly as important as whether you have it or not, right? They, they don't have so many options that they get to pick and choose and only eat the foods they like. They just need to eat every day. And so whatever somebody puts in front of them, you're like, fish heads and cold bread, no thank you. No, they're like, yes, please, I just need to eat today. And he gives them more than they can eat. Many of these people had never had the experience of having more than they could eat put in front of them. And Jesus does it. And so what do they want? More of that, please. So at the end, they pack everything up. Jesus sends the disciples in a boat across the lake. And then he goes up on the mountain to pray. Um, The crowd wants more of this, and so they go around the lake to follow the disciples in the boat. They're like, well, those guys probably have the secret. We know they took the leftovers with them, so let's at least go and get that. And so they go around the lake to meet the disciples on the other side, and when they get there, Jesus is there. And they're like, hey, you went up on the mountain. How did you get here? And he's like, don't worry about it. He doesn't even address it. He doesn't tell them the whole story about how he walked across the lake at night while the disciples were fooling around in the storm and met and got over there before them. So he he doesn't even tell them that. He's like, I know why you're here. You're here because you want more bread. And they're like, yes, got it in one. Good job, Jesus. We want more bread. And then he begins to tell them, there is something better than more bread that I can give you. There's something I can give you that's better than more bread. And they're like, eh, we doubt it. I I, I, kind of doubt it. Like the idea of having food to eat every single day, I don't know that you can give me anything better than that. And Jesus says, watch this. this so this is where we pick up in verse 35. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, if there's something on the screen that's underlined, please read that aloud. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me and for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that And I will raise them up at the last day. All right, so Jesus takes their um, request for more physical bread and says, I have something better, and that something better is me. He says, if, if, if I'm the source, if, if you come to me as the source for your hunger, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it every single day without fail. I'll never let you down. There will always be enough. I will take care of it. Do you need acceptance and belonging? I'm your guy. Listen to the things that, that he says. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. That, that sounds like acceptance to me, doesn't it? Jesus is not seeing all these people who come to him and going, you, not you, you, not you. I don't like your attitude. You got a nice hair, haircut. He's not doing any of that. He's saying, if you come, I got you. Uh, there's no judgment. There's no evaluation. You don't have to pass a test. That's acceptance. Jesus says, I shall lose none of those the Father gives me. He says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna forget about you. Isn't that the thing that makes you feel unaccepted and like you don't belong is when a group of people forget about you? 
Some of you have had this experience with the church, maybe even this church. You didn't show up for a while, and nobody called, and you thought, I don't think I matter to them at all. If that happened to you here, I'm sorry. That's probably my fault, and we'll do better. But it won't happen with Jesus, ever. He's not going to forget about you. If you forget to pray for a few years, and then you pray, he's been thinking about you the whole time. He doesn't forget. If you're hungry for acceptance and belonging, Jesus is telling this this crowd, I got you. I have exactly what you need. We kind of know this. There, there's something about, if you've, if you've been around church, if you've read scripture, if you've done any praying, you kind of know this. So why is it that we often still feel hungry for acceptance and belonging? We still feel like we're, we don't have enough. I think it's because our enemy is so good at lying to us about other ways to have those needs met that, that we just buy into these myths, these lies about other opportunities to receive acceptance and belonging, and they don't satisfy. It's like when you're, when you're hungry, but the thing that you choose to eat is junk food, and then an hour later, you're hungry again because that's not what hunger is for. Hunger is not so to remind you that you need to eat something tasty. Hunger is to remind you that you need to eat something nutritious, but we, we buy into the lie and our bodies get into these habits of saying, I'm hungry, therefore I want something tasty. Instead of I'm hungry, therefore I need something nutritious. You see the difference? We do the same thing spiritually. We hunger for acceptance and belonging. And so we go to something that's tasty, but not nutritious. Now, what could that be? Social media can be tasty for our acceptance and belonging needs. We, we can, we can if, you say, if you learn to say the right things, you post the right pictures, you use the right filters, you like the right people, you can find a little hit of acceptance and belonging there. But it's not nutritious. Uh, affinity groups. So we have, we, we, we're sort of organized in our culture by affinity groups, by th- these people like these things and therefore they're connected in this way. And so it happens politically. You can find political affinity groups. These are the people who have the same you know, positions on these issues that I have. Therefore, we're connected and I can find belonging there. Um, you can find it in sports fandom, right? You, you've got your team and anybody else that's, that's likes your team, you feel this connection with. You could be in the airport in Chicago and you're walking through and you see somebody wearing a Colts jersey and you're like, that's my brother right there. Don't know his name, never met him before, but we're family, right? Like you, that's how you feel. You're connected to other people who like the things that you like. And our culture will trick us into thinking like that can satisfy your need for acceptance and belonging. So buy another Colts jersey. Just don't put a name on the back. They're not gonna be around very long. Just like, but get, get this connection with the people that, that like the same things you like. There's nothing wrong with, with being a fan of, of a team. I'm a, I'm a fan of teams. The, the Atlanta Braves are gonna get themselves together and win the next game, maybe. I don't know. But if that's where I'm going for acceptance and belonging, it's gonna let me down. Those people can't give me what I really need. And so these, these things like social media and affinity groups, I've, I've come to think of them as spiritual tapeworms. You guys know what a tapeworm is? I, I did some study on it. I totally regret it. I was going to show a picture. I was going to put a picture of a tapeworm on the screen, and I thought, this is gross. Nobody wants to see that. Have you ever seen it? Oh, man. Some of you are like, I'm curious now. Google it right now. It's terrible. So, but a tapeworm is something that, that gets into your digestive system, and it steals your nutrients out of the things that you eat. It does a lot of other things, too, that we're not going to go into. But it does that, and so you, you eat, but you never feel satisfied. That's how I think of some of these things, these lies that our culture tells us about where you can find acceptance and belonging. If you just get connected with the right groups of people who believe the things and like the things you like, or if you show up in this particular way where people think that you're smart or that you're funny or that you're needy or whatever it is, then, then you'll find what you need. And it's, it is just a taper. It's all lies. It's not going to fill you up. Jesus says, if you, if you want life, if you want this eternal kind of life, I'm your guy and no one else can give it to you. Let's, let's continue. Uh, and verse 53, Jesus is continuing this conversation. 
Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Okay, quick side note. Um, The synagogue in Capernaum is probably still there. This could possibly be like the foundation of the first century synagogue in Capernaum. And I got to stand there and imagine Jesus teaching uh, this particular lesson and uh, I did not want to leave. It was really cool, right? I was, I was like, can we just stay here for a while? Um, so I just want to thank uh, you, my church family, for letting me do that. It was really cool. Um, back to the sermon. Uh, so uh, Jesus is using, he, he talks about life uh, a lot in this little passage, eternal life. And then he kind of draws this line of progression from the living father sent me. I, I have my life from the father And then the life that I have, I am offering to you. So there is this source that all life comes from. So this eternal kind of life comes from God. And Jesus says, I have that life and I am making it available to you. And here's how you get it. It's really simple. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you're like, huh? That sounds weird. It didn't sound weird, I don't think, to the people Jesus is talking to. Um, After this, a lot of people stopped following Jesus. I don't think it's because they thought he was going to start cutting off fingers and serving them up on a platter. I think it's because um, of what Jesus is saying here. So he's drawing from some old covenant practices of animal sacrifices where you, you can offer a sacrifice and, and it gets cooked and then the priests actually eat some of it and you can take some and you eat some of it and you're eating the flesh of the sacrifice and that's your connection to God. But it's, it's Jesus saying that if you want life, the life that you were created for, you have to go all in with me. And, and for a lot of people, they're like, it's almost like he's saying he's God. You think? That's exactly what he's saying. And, and some people just couldn't reconcile that. I don't, I don't know how this, this man, he's standing right in front of us. And I mean, he's a really good teacher and he's done some miracles I can't quite explain, but is he really God? I mean, do I have to center my life on him to have the life that, that God created me for? And Jesus' answer is, yeah, yeah, you do. Like, I, I, I am the center of eternal life. I'm the source. You can't get it apart from me. Scripture backs that up over and over again. And this is the intimacy that we long for. This idea of being fully known and fully loved. That's what Jesus is talking about. You don't get any closer than eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That's that's as close as you can get, right? Is you're taking into yourself. And this is why communion, I think, is such a powerful experience that we share together is we're taking into ourselves the body and blood of Jesus. It's physical and it's spiritual and it's powerful. And it's a statement of intimacy. I know you inside and out and I love you. We are built to hunger for this. And we look for it in the people around us. And I can tell you, I I mean, there are people like my parents. I know my parents all my life, believe it or not. And they still don't know everything about me. They don't know me fully. Now, they love me, but they don't know everything about me. My wife, 23 years, doesn't know everything about me. Not that I'm keeping secrets, sweetheart, but like there's just things I haven't, like you haven't been there for all of my moments. The only one who's been there for all of my moments is Jesus. The only one who can know me fully is Jesus. And Jesus has promised, I know you fully and I love you. I think that's a fear that we have. If, if people got to know us better, if they knew this part of my life or these thoughts that I've had or these experiences that I've been through, then they wouldn't respect me. They wouldn't accept me. They wouldn't like me. Jesus knows all of those moments and he loves you. That's intimacy. That's the promise that he gives in this passage. And I think it's helpful for us sometimes to see a picture of, of what this can look like. So I want to show you um, a video real quick. Let's watch this. We 
you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan, and a woman. I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come at noon in the heat, as you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I, I'd still like a drink of water if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Wood. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Long story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. I encourage you to go. You can get on YouTube and watch the rest of that scene. Um, it's the story from John chapter four. And again, artist license, it's not exactly the wording, and, but it's a, it's a picture of what that could have looked like. And what I see here and, and when I read that passage is a woman who did not believe that she was worthy of acceptance and belonging and intimacy. And someone comes along and offers that. And it's, it's just, it's almost too good to be true. And that someone who offers it says, if, if you will accept what I have to offer, I, I will absolutely satisfy your hunger. I'll take care of it. And you can, you can keep coming to me day after day, moment after moment, and I'll always have what you need. I, I think this is a message the world needs to hear, right? I mean, it's what I need to hear, that there, there is an actual answer to my need for acceptance and belonging and intimacy. There's an actual way that, that, that's not just temporary, not just like candy. It's, it's, it's actually going to fill me up. Man, if that's really true, then, then I want it. And, and, and I need to shape my hungers so that that's what I want. I, I need to shape my hunger so that what I really want is something that's actually nutritious. What I really want is Jesus and not something that's inadequate, insufficient for my need. So I want to share with you a recipe for acceptance, belonging, and intimacy. We have these recipes. If you uh, have scanned the QR code on our bulletin, you know that we have some recipes uh, uh, available for you there of, of actual food. There's like a, I think Matthew did an appetizer, Andy did like a main dish, and Amber did a dessert. And you can get all of those recipes, and they're really good. But this is a recipe for something that is um, a spiritual hunger. So the ingredients, again, are, are not rocket science. These, these are not things that, that are going to be brand new. You're not going to go, wow, I, I never know. I, I needed to, to do that. Um, it's just scripture. We need, we need to be immersed in scripture. Uh, we need to pray. We need to learn how to speak to God and how to listen to God. And um, we, need, we need Christian community. We need that, that covenant community uh, of people. And so, um, so here's our, our prep step. Um, we want to steep a large serving of scripture in a long moment of prayer and bring it to our community. So this is not like, uh, we got to get past the verse of the day. The verse of the day is great. If you're, if you're on the Bible app and you got the verse of the day and somebody talks about it, we, we, just need to get, we just need to go beyond that. We need to go beyond the verse of the day. We need, we need to immerse ourselves in scripture um, and uh, in prayer. And we need to bring that to a community of believers that have the same goals that we have. We, we're all moving in the direction of Jesus-centered living together. So that's, that's what we need to do. And so here's, here's, how you, here's how you do it. The actual action step is uh, you just need to show up. You need to show up in environments where you're gonna encounter the bread of life, 
We're, we're, we're gonna, you're gonna be rubbing shoulders with people who have the same uh, spiritual goals as you. You're not in the same place on the journey probably. And um, we are full of grace and patience for people that are in different places on the journey from us, but we're moving in the same direction. You need to show up. That's Sunday morning. That's as we gather to worship together as a family of believers. That's your micro church or your Bible study. That's your time at the coffee shop with a friend where you're just reading scripture and praying together. But you gotta show up. I, I really like how uh, Jamie Smith says this. Uh, in his book, this is a long quote, but it's, I couldn't figure out where to cut it, so I'll just read the whole thing. He says, the church, the body of Christ, is the place where God invites us to renew our loves, reorient our desires, and retrain our appetites. Indeed, isn't the church where we are nourished by the word, where we eat the word and receive the bread of life? The church is that household where the spirit le- feeds us what we need and where by his grace we become people who desire him above all else. Christian worship is the feast where we acquire new hungers for God and for what God desires and are then sent into his creation to act accordingly. That's a pretty good description. You're like, well, you should have just read that and then sat down and we'd have been fine, but you had to talk for 35 minutes. Like th- this is what we're talking about. This is retraining, reshaping our appetites and it happens in this covenant community. It doesn't happen just by you getting more knowledge about you know, I need to read the Bible. Yep, got it. I need to pray. I need to, I need to go to church. Like, you actually have to do it. You have to show up. And so step two, it's, it's genius. You, you won't see it coming. Step two, keep showing up. You have to keep showing up. Here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna show up sometimes and, and, and nothing's gonna happen. Like, you're, you're gonna have like no emotion, no experience, or you're gonna have a bad experience. Somebody's gonna look at you funny. Somebody's gonna say something you didn't like. Somebody's gonna walk down the hall and not speak to you, and you're gonna take it personally. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. Keep showing up. If, if you're on Noom or Weight Watchers and you're supposed to count your points or track your, um, your eating habits and you only do it once a month, is that gonna be helpful? Nope. You gotta do it every single day. I had somebody after first service walked out and said, I just lost, I lost 34 pounds on this program. I've, I've been doing this for 270 days. I was like, that's a really specific number. He's like, well, I do it every single day. I'm like, every single day? 270 days, every single day, I lost 34 pounds. I was like, great, congratulations. But you gotta do it every day, right? And he's like, yeah, I gotta do it every day. This, this is no, if, if this is the only way that our hunger for acceptance and belonging and intimacy can be satisfied, we gotta show up every day. I don't mean come here every day. I won't be here every day, you know, but you have to get connected to a a covenant community, a group of people, an individual, somebody that's moving in the same direction as you. And you, every day, you've just got to keep showing up. Is it that simple? Yeah. It's also hard, isn't it? Because there are a lot of other things that are demanding for you to show up in your life, right? I got to show up at work. I got to show up for my kids. I got to show up on the couch for Netflix. I got to, there's a lot of places I got to show up. And, I, and you're telling me I have to show up here? I'm like, this is, this is the place you have to show up. This is the environment. This is the community you got to show up for every day. And then all of that other stuff will be brought into the right perspective. So that's my prayer for you, is that you'll, you'll show up every day, that, that you'll begin to hunger for the things that actually fill you. And that as you do that, we are, we are sending a message to the world around us that pulls back the curtain on the lies that they're told about these other spiritual tapeworms and how they're gonna fill you up and they never do. We're gonna expose all of that through our lifestyle, through our words, in ways that draw people to the bread of life. We're gonna do that together. Are you with me? Let's pray. Would you stand? And we'll, we'll close with a word of prayer. God, we're just grateful that we've been invited to the table for the bread of life, that the life you offer us, the life in your kingdom, the eternal kind of life that Jesus died to give us, this life where we get to live under forgiveness and grace every day, we get to live with this purpose, we get to live with this acceptance and belonging and intimacy every day. What an incredible invitation. God, my prayer is that you would begin to change our hungers. Help us to long for the things that really fill us up. Help us to long for Jesus. And as we do that, God, and we find satisfaction in Christ, would you help us to show the people around us, the people who don't know what Jesus has to offer, that they can find satisfaction for their hungers in Christ as well. 
And may we see more and more people center their lives on your son. In his name we pray, amen. God bless you. Go and be salt and light in a world that desperately needs Christ.